Church. My name is Charlie. It's good to be with you. If you're out in the lobby, just come on in. We want to get started. If you're new and this is your first time, we're so glad you're here. Sorry for the rain. It's because I washed my car. And if you're able, let's stand and worship God through song. You don't need the words I say. You don't need the songs I sing. You don't need my empty prayers or selfish offerings. You don't need my best intentions or broken promises. Cause you love me.
always look for an opportunity to uh, share with you guys what God is kind of showing me. And uh, this week, Scott and I did a funeral. Um, I don't know if you guys know Darren. He plays percussion on the end there with us. Sometimes his father passed away. So Scott preached the funeral, and I got to sing some old hymns at it. And, you know, you always process what happens when somebody leaves this place we call Earth, this side of heaven. And less than 24 hours later, I had to pick my daughter up at the airport, and she'd been gone a week visiting uh, my niece. So it's 1 a.m., and I'm in the airport, and I'm balancing what I'm seeing in the airport and what I'm feeling from my friend Darren and having to bury his dad. And I thought, okay, God, just start talking to me. And all of a sudden, up the aisle, you know, under the, under the canopy, I'm up on the railing upstairs, top of the escalator. I see my daughter, and she's got her hand up in the air. And she's waving at me, and I'm like, hey, Abby. It's almost a welcome home, but it's not a welcome home until you wrap your arms around her. And then she gets to the top of the escalator, and I'm like, welcome home, welcome home. And she gives me a big hug. She's like, I gotta go to the bathroom, and she leaves. <laughs> And then this, this girl comes in, she's a minor, and she's traveling on a company. And she's in this big tiger, whatever print, one piece jumper with hoodies and ears and everything. And she must have been traveling with a flight attendant. So her family is at the top of the escalator. And the flight attendant comes up and, and announces, she's here. And it's this moment of this family running around this, this little girl and all the hugs and they're jumping up and down and stuff. It was just a cool moment and I thought to myself, is that heaven? Is that what you're showing me? Like, did Darren's dad enter heaven and all those that went before him were on the outside going, he's here, he's here. And then it's that, you're not home yet until it's like, oh, welcome home. And then I thought, is that what it's like for us when we lay eyes on our heavenly father for the first time? Is it the family that went before us inside the gate going, there he is, there he is, he's here, there she is. And then it's that moment that you realize you're, you're laying your eyes on the one and only Jesus Christ, son of man, salvation of my soul. And then you think maybe that's what it's like when he goes, welcome home. And then you go and you see your family. I don't know if that's what heaven is, but last night or two nights ago at 1 a.m. That's what heaven was for me it's in, at CVG. So as we get ready to worship, uh, continue to worship, think about what that moment is. And if you're on the fence, if you're thinking about giving your life to Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, but maybe as a kid, and now you're thinking, I just need to get back. I need to get back in church. I need to get back. Before you find the church, find that place where you can invite God into your heart, worship him, build your life around that. Because I truly believe if we saw five seconds of heaven, it would change the way we live the rest of our life. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever give. worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you sing this out holy there is no one like you there is none beside
Heavenly Father, thank you for every voice that was lifted. Praise of you. God, this side of heaven, we just can't see it. We can't imagine it. But because of your relationship with us, we get glimpses, maybe in an airport at one in the morning, of what a heavenly reunion will be like. Heavenly Father, open our eyes, our hearts, our minds to hear you, to move when you say move, to stop when you say stop, and to serve when you say serve. We thank you for keeping your promise and going to the cross when you probably could have gotten out of it. It's funny to think that Jesus has this attitude that it's not about him, it's about us. But it's all about him, amen? Amen. Well, good morning. Man, that was good, wasn't it? I love hearing stories about heaven. I love getting glimpses of heaven. I just get giddy, and I can feel that smile here all the way over there. I love it. Um, my name's Shelly, and I'm the Creative Arts Pastor. I am so glad that you are worshiping with us. Hey, online campus, glad that you are tuning in with us this morning. And we would love to hear from you guys this week. Easy ways to do that. We have these... Uh, little programs. If you grabbed one, there is a connect card on the bottom. You fill that out, toss it in one of the offering boxes on your way out the door. You can go to communitychristianchurch.com and click connect, or you can point your phone at that QR code on the screen or in the chair right in front of you. That'll take you there as well. But hey, we would love to hear from you. If you have questions, comments, prayer requests, we pray over y'all every single week. So let us hear back from you. And when you walked in, you probably saw these little cups. Um, hopefully you grabbed one. This is the juice and the bread. We use these to celebrate communion. We're going to do that together at the very end of the service. Listen, we invite everyone to the table. All are welcome here. So if you didn't grab one, they're in the chair racks right in front of you. Online campus, do the best you can. I don't know. Go find some goldfish crackers or something. Come right back. We'll be here. And you guys, offering is any time you want it to be. We are a giving church. We serve a generous God. We want to be a generous people. We want to look like him. So if you would like to partner alongside with us, it's so easy. Y'all can uh, drop your offering in the offering boxes. You can text to give. You can click giving on the website. Whatever works for you, we are glad that we can do that together. And speaking of giving, if you are a teacher, an educational assistant, a homeschooler, or just someone who hasn't had a box of new crayons in a really long time, we would love for you to stop downstairs and pick up some school supplies. We have so much. We want to make sure that you guys have everything you need for the school year. So please, after the service, go downstairs, hit that room, clean it out, and uh, we want to make sure that you're ready. And we've had a lot of people ask about our friends in Jackson, Kentucky after the flooding. What can we do to help? Well, they have sent us a very specific list of cleaning items and hygiene items. This is all that they need right now. This is all that they can handle right now. So if you would like to start bringing that stuff in, 
We're going to make trips down there. Or you can click on that QR code that will send you to an Amazon list that goes straight to the church. So however you want to do that, this is an ongoing project, you guys. We are long-term partners with them. So we are in it for the long run. So jump in and help with that. And Wednesday night kickoff. We're just a few weeks away. On the 31st, our Wednesday night programs are starting back up. That's kids programs, student programs, adult small groups. If you have not been up here on a Wednesday night, you're missing. Because it is, it is where the fun is. It's where the cool kids are. So come on, and you'll find a spot for you, I promise. Um, and then, okay, the last thing I have is this year we have committed as a church to memorizing scripture together this is one of my favorite things i'm a huge bible nerd i love that we do this together we use the memory tools from dwelldifferently.com and this is our verse for the month but i want you to hear the verse right before this one it says and to the jews who had believed him jesus said if you hold to my teaching you are really my disciples. Then, say it with me, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 8, 38. Believe, hold to those teachings. It will take you to the truth every single time. And now let's listen to the message together. Good morning. Man, great to see you all today. Online campus, welcome. We're glad you're here with us as well. We've got some really fun uh, family, church family news to do today. If I can have uh, Zach, Greg, and Mandy come up on stage. Uh, we have hired three new staff members in the past few weeks, and these guys are all part-time, but they all work full-time hours being part-time paid. So just so you, you kind of get where that goes. This is Zach. Uh, Zach is in charge of our comm building uh, we built that beautiful building and then COVID hit and it's kind of sat there a little bit. Zach's in charge of marketing that, finding ways to make that a community hangout type place uh, for all age groups of people in, in, in this area. And he's also going to be doing and looking at what we can do to change some things up for some 20-somethings in a morning worship type experience. Uh, he's a musician, and he's doing so many great things right now, better than I even anticipated when he came on staff. This is Mandy Kylander. Mandy is actually, this is her second time on staff with us. Mandy was our very first children's pastor, like 28, 29 years ago. So they have been uh, our oldest and dearest friends, Chris and Mandy, uh, since we moved to this area, and really excited to see what she's bringing uh, on board with us. Again, she's been doing ministry for forever, and she's here to do some communication, make sure you all know what's happening, what we're into, what are projects that are going on, and she's also here to provide some community connection points, so like big all-church type events, like I don't know. You think of it, she's going to be coming up with those ideas, putting them together so we can connect better as a church family, something we haven't done very well over the past few years. And on the end is Greg, and uh, Greg is actually a high school teacher for Fairfield. He's taught German there forever. He taught all three of my boys German, and they loved him uh, in high school, and I'm really excited uh, that Greg's on staff with us. He's doing all of our online campus and our social media stuff. So if you would, will you give them all a big round of applause for being with us? <laughs> Guys, exciting things happening around here. So many incredible volunteers working and serving, and then a little extra staff push uh, to get some things done. I I'm just excited about our future uh, also, in two weeks is Contribute Sunday. Now, Contribute Sunday for us, we come together, we worship, um, and then we send you all out to make an impact in the community. And we're not providing those opportunities. You need to come up with your family, three or four friends, some neighbors, and go do something to make an impact in the name of Jesus on that Sunday, right? So I'm going to give you some options that maybe you want to think about. Happy Church is so dear to us. And we've helped them in so many ways, and they've helped us in so many ways, giving us opportunities to be God's hands and feet. 
And on the 28th, 26, 27, 28, that weekend, uh, maybe for you, and you want to get 10 people together, maybe you want to drive to Jackson, Kentucky. We'll have a sign up for this one. And maybe you want to feed three or 400 people. There are, there are people down there serving in Jackson, helping to clean things out. There are people there, obviously, that are in need, desperate need of just food. And so maybe you want to think about that. Maybe you get 10 people and go, you know, we want to make sloppy joes or 10 people that go, you know, we're going to do hamburgers and hot dogs. And maybe you go down Friday or Saturday or a couple times, you know, two different slots on, on Sunday. And we have places for you to set up down there just to be able to contribute and make an impact. So maybe that's something you want to do. Or maybe you want to look at, we've got to dig out mud from, from the basement of their main church building there uh, because it's just full of gunk in that building. We need to dig that out. We need to tear down a couple of trailers that are there. Maybe you're a handyman and you want to be part of that. We can make some of that happen that weekend as well. But that's our Contribute Weekend. Don't come to church and worship and go home and go, oh, well, you know, I showed up at the church. I'm done. That's my contribution for the day because that's not a contribution. A contribution is you getting out of these seats and making an impact in somebody's life. Amen. All right? So think about that. And we've only got two weeks until that happens. So start planning. Send us emails and text. Let us know what you'd like to be doing. So let's jump in today. Anybody else loving these cool fall-like temperatures. I got up Thursday morning, and I went out on our screened-in porch, and I'm like, it's cold out here. So I ran back in the house and threw a hoodie on. I'm thinking, man, this is nice. And then, I'm not saying we caused this to happen, but then I went inside, and I made our newly bought at Kroger pumpkin spice Starbucks coffee with pumpkin spice creamer, and I sat out on my porch in my shorts and hoodie with the aroma of pumpkin spice. Guys, there's nothing better than that for me. I'm just telling you, that's like a little slice of heaven right there. That's all it is. We're in the middle of a teaching series called When Pigs Fly, and we've adopted this from Life Church, and it's all about miracles. That's what it's about. It's all about miracles. When you hear the word miracle, What's the first thing that comes to your mind? God, supernatural, weird, strange, healing, God's presence. We have all these thoughts that come into our minds when we, when we think about miracles. Now, here's what I think people think when they think about miracles. It's one of three basic thoughts. Either they just don't happen anymore you're like, yeah, I, I mean, I get it, but that's a wind pigs fly kind of thing, you know? It, it's like an abstract kind of, kind of thing. It doesn't really happen. It's not going to happen anymore. It's, it, it's too wild to even think about. Or you believe in miracles, and you're kind of waiting on one to happen for your personal life. Or maybe you've experienced miracles in your life. Most of us believe that God has done miracles, but it's been like a long time ago right? I mean, nothing recent. You can't read through any part of the Bible without seeing God doing something miraculous. You just can't. You can't read it without seeing that. Most of us, we just don't believe he's going to do a miracle for us, though. We see it, we know it, we just don't believe it's going to be for our lives. Well, to believe it's going to be for your life, you need to understand what a miracle is. So here's a definition a miracle is when an all-knowing, ever-present God intervenes in our lives. A miracle is when an all-knowing, ever-present God intervenes in our lives. And it doesn't matter what He does. He might intervene physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. It could be anything. But when God intervenes, that's a miracle. Maybe there was a tumor. Now there isn't. It's just gone. Maybe you were in a car wreck and you're thinking, there is no way I should have walked away from that wreck. No way. But yet you walked away from the wreck. Maybe you destroyed your marriage and there's no way your spouse should still be with you, but they are. Do you think those, ha those things happen just by sheer willpower? No way. Those things happen because God intervened. Because God showed up. 
God showed up and now your life is so much different than what it could have been if he didn't show up. We started our series last week talking about the four different types of miracles in the Bible. Miracles of healing and protection and provision and deliverance. And last week we talked about the power of deliverance, the power over the forces of darkness. And honestly, when I was studying for this series, it was like the whole spiritual battle thing just kind of blows my mind a little bit, right? I mean, it's just kind of like, is, is that really real? The fact that there are spiritual battles happening all around us every day of our lives that we don't typically see, and sometimes we could see them, but we choose not to see them. Ephesians 6 says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's what we talked on last week. This week, we're going to camp out on this miracle of of healing. Now, this is a big one. I mean, last week was huge as well. This is another big one, right? You either tend to believe that God can heal you physically, or you tend to not believe that he can heal you physically. There's not a whole lot of middle ground on this one. And I don't know where you are on this, But track with me today because we're going to look at some really interesting things. Take a look through the Bible. I mean, just do a scan on miracles in the Bible. Take a look. There are all kinds of miracles all through it. Just in the New Testament, there are over 30 miracles that are listed where somebody was physically sick or had some type of physical issue in some way and Jesus or one of the apostles healed them. And now it's implied that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more miracles that we only have a snippet of what happened in Jesus' life, right? We just, a little piece of that. But these things are happening all the time, everywhere, when Jesus was here. Now, what did he do? Well, we know that Jesus gave sight to people that were blind. We know that Jesus, people that were deaf, he gave them the ability to hear. We know that he gave people that couldn't walk the ability to walk again. We know that Jesus even raised the dead. I mean, those are some of the miracles that we see in the New Testament. And so we're going to talk about all those types of miracles today and see what God has in store for you. During our teaching team meeting, we always kind of bat around what the next topics are for the next several weeks. And we were talking about this one. And I asked them what their favorite miracle was. And Shelly Mosler, there's four of us on our teaching team, Shelly Mosler kind of spoke up. She said, well, I kind of love the time when Jesus heals Peter, the Apostle Peter's mother-in-law. And I said, well, what makes that stand out to you? What's the significance of it? So she read it. Here it is, Matthew 8, 14. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house... Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. Now, this isn't just, oh, I've got a cold. This is, you're not going to live much longer kind of high fever, all right? But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. Shelly said, that is just like my mom. My mom would be on her deathbed, and Jesus could come and heal her. She'd pop up and say, all right, what do you want for dinner? What can I fix for you? And I'm, I'm reading that going, That's a really cool kind of statement, isn't it? I mean, it shows her heart, but it kind of shows where she was. And come on, Jesus, let me feed you. Let me take care uh, of you guys. Someone said that the healing of Peter's mother-in-law is the most controversial of all the miracles in the New Testament because so many scholars believe it's the reason Peter denied Jesus three times. Think on it. Wait for it. It'll hit you. Mother-in-law healed, not a good relationship. Peter goes off. I don't know. I've got a great mother-in-law, so I, I can't track with that. But I believe that the same power that healed Peter's mother-in-law and healed the blind and healed the deaf, the, the, the deaf and, and, and allowed people to walk on this earth is the same power that is still present for us today. It didn't go away. It hasn't disappeared We've just forgotten how to tap in and to use it. We miss the power that's here. 
Friends, we are connected to the God of the universe, the God that created everything. We're connected to Him, and nothing is impossible with God. He's a God who can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. That's the God we're connected to. Have you ever prayed for a miracle and He did it? Anybody? Has that ever happened, been part of your life? It, it, it's pretty interesting, isn't it? My mom, and I miss my mom dearly, because she used to tell incredible stories. And I'm going, Mom, is that real? You know, I mean, you just kind of question, because she could talk, and she could tell some pretty good stories. And she would always tell stories about me, never about my sister. They were just always about me for some reason. And she, 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 was, she would always tell people, anybody that would listen she would talk about over my 14th birthday, I spent the entire summer, I was in the hospital for three months. And it was a, it was a tough moment. It was one of those touch and go moments. They weren't sure if I was going to make it. I was that sick. And, and my memory of being in the hospital, I was in Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh on the top floor, which was the ICU type, type units. And uh, my memory was the fact that they kept putting IVs in me and the IVs would pop out. And it was before they did the, you know, we'll put a line in you and you'll be fine. We can run everything through there. I had seven, counted them, 72 IVs over that three-month period in the hospital. Still traumatizes me. I can't do IVs still because of how, how, how bad that was when, when, when I was growing up. My blood work just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And they're doing all the tests and all the, you know, the scans that they had the knowledge to do back then. And finally they said, you, you've got to, told my mom and dad, he has a, a softball-sized tumor in, in this area, so in the internal organs in that area. And they wanted to do an exploratory surgery you know, to try to remove the tumor. And my mom, um, I, I know it sounds kind of strange, my mom said no. Now, my mom was a powerful woman. When, when she was upset, you knew she was upset, right? She said, no, you're not going to do that. You're, you're, you're not going to do that surgery. I'm going to step back and start praying for God to heal him because you guys don't have any clues at this point, and I'm not going to let you do that. Now, I was in the hospital for three months, so this wasn't like an overnight, oh, God reached down, healed me, I'm good, I go home the next day. This is over three months in the hospital, Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. And, and I know when I say that, I know it sounds like a bad religious TV show where you're going, don't be so stupid. Let the doctors do what they're gifted to do. Why, why would you just say, I'm going to pray for them to, to be? That's, that's just way, and that wasn't my mom all the time, but that was certainly her mindset. But she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and the more she prayed, the more sick I got. Three months. One day I remember specifically the team of doctors called my mom and dad out into the hallway, and they're talking out there, and they're going, we don't understand this, but the tumor's gone. And now, you don't need to clap for that. It is a cool God thing. But it's one of those moments where you're going, my blood work started getting better and better and better after that, and a few weeks later, I was able to go home. Now, the doctors may not have been able to explain that, but my mom could. And my mom told everybody about it because it was one of the most miraculous things that she had ever seen. Now, for me, later on in my life, I felt guilty because I got out of the hospital. I felt guilty because on that floor of Children's Hospital, remember my dad pushing me in a wheelchair down the hallway. You have small kids with IVs coming out of their heads and that, that no hair because of the cancer treatments they were going through. And, and you see that and you go, how does God heal me? But he doesn't heal them. Why does that happen? Where's God? I mean, I know God can heal. I mean, I experienced that. But, but why didn't God do what I know that he can do? And where is he in the middle of those moments? God, I know you can, but... Why does my son still deal with autism? God, I, I know you can, but why does my daughter still face depression all the time? God, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed, but 
Why did my mom still die of COVID? How do we pray if we believe that God can and we know that he's done it in the past, but he doesn't do what we want him to do now? How do we, how do we rationalize that? How do we connect with that? That's the challenge. Because God heals, but he doesn't heal everyone all the time. And it's hard for us. That's true for all of us. It doesn't matter if you're far away from God or if you're close to God. It just doesn't matter. Because whoever we are, God doesn't heal all of us all of the time. Sometimes God has other plans. I mean, read through the New Testament. There's a guy named, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Trophimus? I don't know. I've never read about this guy before, and I've read the Bible my whole life. And I never saw this until two weeks ago. Anyway, he's going with Paul on his third missionary journey, and you only see like one sentence about this guy in the Bible. But Trophimus got sick, and God apparently didn't heal him. I mean, he left his job, he left his family, he's going on this missionary journey with the Apostle Paul, and he's sick and God doesn't heal him. 2 Timothy 4.20, Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. How does that happen? They, they just kind of left him. Oh, you're sick, sorry, you can't go with us, we're taking off, hope you're okay. God could have healed him, but he didn't. One that stands out to me is the Apostle Paul. He had some kind of sickness or disease or issue in his life that Paul calls a thorn in his flesh. Now, we don't know what it was for sure. We, we just don't know. It, it could have been some type of, maybe it was uh, eyesight issues or maybe health issues or maybe he had a hip type issue. And, and, and we don't know exactly what it was, but Paul pleaded with God three times. And it wasn't just like, oh, God, heal this, God, heal this, God, heal this. It was like just deep pleading with God for days and days and days, take this away from me. And God says, no, I'm not going to take it away. I could, but I'm not going to. My grace is going to be sufficient for you. Now, why wouldn't God heal one of the most influential people in the history of Christianity? God had different plans for his life. Maybe Paul needed to experience this to put him on the right track in the right moment, in the right situation. I know, I know you, you, you can do bigger things. And God says, I could, but I'm not going to for you. I believe God does more than we ever realize. I believe there are healings taking place that we don't even see as being from God, and yet God's certainly a part of those God says, I could, but I'm not going to. Or maybe I did, and you didn't see it. And here's one of the problems in our culture. We have become, as Christ followers sometimes, so vigilant trying to understand things that we destroy people's lives. Do you know anybody like this? Hey, listen. L -l listen, Sue. Listen, Jim. Your daughter's sick. And the reason she's sick is because there's sin in your life. Whew. That's pretty harsh. Where'd they get that from? Well, it's a misinterpretation of Scripture for one thing. It's not what Scripture says, but that's what they're saying. Your daughter's sick because of your sin. If you didn't have sin in your life, your daughter would be fine. Just heaping that guilt on you, which isn't true. Or, or, or like, you, you know, you're not praying right. If you were praying the right way, then, then, then your son would be okay. Well-meaning Christ followers just piling this guilt and condemnation on everyone around them when it's not right. So if that's you, if you've ever done that, if you've ever been in that scenario, stop! You're not God. And you have no right to sit in that seat of judgment on them. And not only that, you're dead wrong with what you're saying. So do a little more research before you say those kinds of things. Let's look at the reasons Jesus didn't do miracles in the New Testament. I think this is pretty interesting. First of all, Jesus never did miracles to prove himself. Never. He, he wouldn't do it. Did you ever bargain with God? 
I mean, did you, did you ever get in a scenario where you just needed something and you're bargaining with God, God, please, just, just do this one thing for me and I'll be at church next week. I promise I'm going to show up. Or God, just provide this new job for me and, and then I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give money back to you, God. I mean, that's a good deal for you, God. I mean, give me this job and then you get some money back, right? Or, or God, please, just, just do this one thing for me and and I'll even go to Jackson, Kentucky and help those poor, desperate people down there. Just do something for me, God, and, and, and I'll bargain with you. God, it's kind of like getting a new dog. Please, Dad, get the dog. I'll feed it and walk it and clean up after it and, and, and groom it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And you know, you're, you know your kid's not going to do it. Or maybe your wife, Paul Hornsby, I don't know, not going to do it. Donna just got a new dog this week. So anyway, we got, you know it's not going to happen. And God's looking at us going, you know you're not going to follow through with any of that stuff. I know you're not going to follow through with any of that stuff. And I'm not going to try to prove myself to you. Mark 8, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. And they asked him for a sign from heaven. And he sighed and deeply said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, There's not going to be one given to you. It's just not going to happen. They're saying, do something to prove that you're the Son of God. And Jesus just sighs and says, I'm not going to do tricks for you. I don't have to prove myself. I'm not going to do these miracles. Now, here's the second reason we see Jesus not doing miracles. He never did a miracle that interfered with God's plans. I think this is interesting. You, You know, Uh, when Judas, most of you know that story, Judas betrays Jesus, and they come to arrest Jesus, and Judas says, the person I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want to arrest. And so he goes and he kisses Jesus on the, ch- on, on the cheek, and, and, and it's like Peter, who I really like a lot, all right? The guards come up to arrest Jesus. I, I really like Peter's attitude a lot. Peter pulls out a sword and said, you're not touching my Jesus, and he takes the sword and he, he swings at one of the guards, Now, I think he was trying to cut his head off, but he was a bad aim, all right? And he just got the guy's ear. So this guy's ear just kind of falls off. And I can just hear Jesus going, Peter, come on. Really? I mean, probably that tone of voice too. Peter, what are you thinking? You know, what are you thinking? Don't you know I've got this under control? Don't, don't, Don't you know that I could take care of this if I wanted to? Where's the ear? I mean, can you, where, where's it at? The bush. Get it out of the bush for me. And he puts it back on the, 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 the guard, and he heals it. That's a cool moment. He's being arrested, and he heals one of the guards. But don't miss this. One moment he's doing a miracle. The next moment, when it would have interfered with God's ultimate plan, <coughs> he doesn't do the miracle. He says, you know, I could have walked away from this, right? I mean, you, you get that, right? Jesus could have just walked away instead of being arrested. Matthew 26, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But if I do that miracle, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? He wasn't going to interfere with God's plan. He was part of the plan. He he withholds the miracle. Jesus also never did a miracle where there was no faith. This is interesting. Matthew 13, 58. He did not do many miracles in his hometown because of their lack of faith. Now, Jesus goes back to his hometown. Everybody knows him there because he grew up there, right? Right? And they're going, uh, no. Aren't you Joseph's boy? I'm still mad at you for being the teacher's pet and getting every question right that the teacher asked in class. I'm not listening to you. I'm not going to follow you. They're annoyed at Jesus. And the scripture says he did not do miracles there because of their lack of faith. We have to understand that our faith moves the heart of God. There was a woman who had this bleeding issue for 12 years, and she's embarrassed, 
She's in deep pain. She's ceremonially unclean. She's not allowed to have any friendships or relationships. And Jesus walks down the, the, the street, and her faith allows her to think, if I can just touch the bottom of his robe, I can be healed. If I can just touch that, I'm going to be okay. So she reaches out, and she touches the hem of Jesus' robe, and it says that Jesus stops because he felt power leaving his body. And he looks around because it's a massive crowd. He looks around, and, and this lady is instantly healed, and it says this in Mark five thirty four: Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, freed from your suffering. Her faith had healed her. A man with leprosy falls on the feet of Jesus and worships him. And Jesus looks at this guy and he says this in Luke 17, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. A blind man screams, Jesus, I can't see you, but I can hear you. And I know you're here. Have mercy on me. And Mark 10, Jesus says, Your faith has healed you. And immediately this guy received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. It's so cool to see that the only thing that amazes Jesus is our faith. But it's cool to know that, right? Sometimes he's amazed by how much faith some of us have. And sometimes he's amazed by how little faith some of us have. Which category do you fit in? Do you have a lot of faith or a little bit of faith? Which one for you? A Roman centurion has a servant that's sick and says, Jesus, I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. You just say the word. You don't have to see him. You don't have to touch him. You don't have to walk in that direction. I just believe if you say the word, then my servant's going to be healed. And Jesus says the word, and his servant is healed. And Jesus, Scripture says, Jesus is amazed and said, I've never seen faith like this. So do you have that kind of faith or do you have Jesus' hometown kind of faith where we don't believe he can do anything? Which one is it? Is he going to be impressed or not impressed? Look at the, 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 the prayers you prayed this last week. Think about those. What would you ask for? Was it so big that if God didn't step in, it couldn't get done? Or was it, uh, thank you for this food and keep me safe today? Big faith or no faith? Because we tend to be one or the other. Which one are you? Do you believe that God needs to be part of something so big for your life that if he doesn't show up, it won't happen? Or do you just have a little bit of faith? I love the story in the Old Testament of, uh, New Testament of a dad that's, he's just in agony because his son is hurting. I mean, his son is, is, is just, he, he's got this, he's been physically beaten down. He's dealing with all kinds of oppression. And then in this dad's desperation, he wants to believe that Jesus can help. And he says this, Jesus, if you can do anything, please do. And Jesus is kind of like, well, anything is kind of what I do. You know, anything's possible with me. And then I love what the father said in Mark 9. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And I think that's where I am a whole lot of times. God, I believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. You need to understand that our faith isn't based on what God does. Our faith is based on who God is. Because our faith isn't based on what he does in just a moment. Our faith is based on what Jesus did on the cross for us. And it doesn't get any better than that. A God who became one of us, who sends his son, Jesus, for us so that our sins could be forgiven. That's the kind of faith I've got in God. It's not based on seeing the results of a miracle. Our faith isn't based on, on something that God can do for us physically. Our faith is based on the goodness of a God who sacrificed everything for us. 
And we need to understand that when God sent Jesus, the highest purpose for Jesus coming to this earth was not to heal our physical bodies. It's to save us. I've come that they would have life and have it to the fullest, more abundantly, to seek and save the lost. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners. I came to give my life as a ransom. His highest purpose isn't to heal our bodies. It's to save us. Here's a little spoiler. Are you ready for this? If God heals you of the cancer you're dealing with, guess what? You're still going to die. Aren't you glad you came today? If God heals you from the disease that you're dealing with, you're still going to die. When God raised Lazarus from the dead, guess what? The next time Lazarus died, he was on his own. You're still going to die. When God healed me when I was 14, I'm still going to die. And that's not what it's about. It's not about Jesus healing my physical body. It's about Jesus giving me a purpose that's bigger than just physical healing. And God may use the physical healing to make an impact, to change somebody's life. Maybe I was healed so I could be here today to talk specifically to you. Maybe that was the purpose of my healing. But that's not the purpose of my faith. My faith, it's a higher purpose. My faith is all about what God has done in my life, and I want people to see what God's done in my life so it can change the lives around me. That's where your faith needs to be. Maybe you live 70, 80, 90 years. That's great. But are people seeing your life and Jesus living in you and through you to change their lives? Because that's why Jesus came. To save those that need him. Let me pray over you this morning. Father God, I'm praying for everyone that needs a miracle. And I believe that's a lot of us listening today. God, I'm praying for your power to be in their lives. Because I believe you're the creator God. You created us. You know our bodies better than we do. And you can heal anything that's wrong with us. And God, I pray for that for these people. But God, if you don't do what we know you can do and you choose to do something else in our lives, may you fill us so full of you that we change the lives of the people around us. Because that's why you came. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going into our time of communion right now, communion and prayer. If you need someone to pray with you or just listen or pray over you, our prayer team will be down front and they'll stay after the service just as long as you need them. But this is when we celebrate communion. We drink this juice, we eat this bread. It's to remind us of Jesus. The book of Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Not just that temporary physical healing, but the real deep healing that really, really matters to be healed with a grace that just restores our relationship with the Father for him to heal and soften our hard hearts and change our stubborn minds that is incredible that's healing and the fact that the sovereign God of the universe wants to be your friend a miracle.
think about now but listen I want you to know something no matter what you're going through no matter how you're feeling today you are a walking breathing miracle all right every breath you breathe comes from the father above so thank him for it go shine his light and we will see you back here next week